Hey y'all, I'm your host Gabrielle. And I'm Alan. Welcome to the Eerie Touch, where we dive into all things murder, mystery, and paranormal every week. We want to give a fair warning that this episode does contain some graphic and disturbing material that may not be suitable for some listeners. Our case today is one of pure horror that has left people in the area just in complete disbelief and utter shock that a member in the community could be so evil, just pure evil. A man from a well-known, well-off family in the community who could have lived out all of the better opportunities that life had to offer, but instead chose to spend his life in a downward spiral until the very end. This is the story of 37-year-old Matthew Cook Casey. Known by his nickname, Matt, Matt was born and raised in Mate 1, West Virginia, where he attended Mate 1 High School. But he was always kind of a troubled kid. Classmates of his have said that he started to fight almost every single day, usually over absolutely nothing. And Matt was a pretty big guy. He was over six feet. I think he was about six one, and he was kind of bulky. Always thought that he was bigger than he really was. And the friends he did make were forever cycling in and out of this because of it. And people said he was a little weird. I know people who went to high school with him, they just said, you know, he was always a little strange, a little off. Mm -hmm. uh, like he was missing something, like a little off in the head. But they always said he, he was basically just a mouthpiece. Yeah, pretty much he was to just every bit of that. It seemed no matter how many fights he lost or how many friends that left, the only thing consistent about Matt was the fact that he could always find a reason to run his mouth over something. Something that ultimately got him into trouble in his adult years. At some point after high school, he fell into drugs, which did nothing but make his bad behavior worse. It was no surprise when Matt would come home bruised up from just another altercation that he had brewed somewhere. Though, it did keep Matt's mother, Margaret, in constant worry over her son. She was a sweet southern belle with those southern roots, and she always tried to look out for her son. She wanted better for him. Margaret tried time and time again to point her son in the right direction, but to no avail. As the years went on, it seemed Matt's choices grew worse. He began stealing checks from his mother, and that became a milestone within their relationship that pushed Matt to find work. He ended up landing a job driving a work truck for a bit, but that didn't last long given Matt's drug abuse. Between not showing up and showing up high, it's fair to say that he was fired. Uh, it's understandable. Mm-hmm. It looked as if no matter what happened, his mother was always there trying to catch him when he fell. Uh, like most mothers would. Why? Well, like really any parents would. You always want to protect your kids from, mm -hmm. you know, anytime they fall down, you want to be there to help them back up. Uh, I mean, you always want to be there for them. Of course. Well, I'd assume any good parent would. It didn't seem to do any good for Matt, though. After that, he didn't really do much of anything that was productive, at least. He laid out most nights getting high and drunk most days. He never thought too much into the consequences of his actions because in the back of his mind, he could always just call his mom or someone in the family. It seemed Matt's number one priority was staying on a bender. However, he would soon get on one bender that he wouldn't be able to come back from. After staying doped up the night before in the early morning hours of December 14, 2006, Matt gets a hellish idea. He makes his way, while it's still dark out, to a Walmart in South Williamson, Kentucky. And for listeners who don't know, Mate 1 and Williamson are on the Kentucky border. Uh, it's right across the river. Most of the stores are in South Williamson, so that's where people usually go when they, when they go to town. Yeah. Well, he makes his trip to Walmart and sits in his own thoughts until around 6.30 that morning. A 59-year-old woman from Naugatuck named Lucy Witt had just began to start her day. Lucy's a sweet elderly woman who's soft-spoken and just gentle all the way around. Though, don't let that fool you. She can be a firecracker, too. She isn't just this, you know, like, feeble woman. She tries to stay healthy and overall just active, going walking, mowing her grass, and she's even tried the gym, which says a lot about her and that alone. She goes to church on Sundays and keeps her Bible close to her at home. In true Southern fashion, she's not one to want to just waste the day away. So when she woke up that morning with that in mind, she goes on to start the day. She wakes up, eats a little breakfast, and decides to go on to the grocery store before it gets too crowded. 
That way it's not like she's spending half her day at the store. And if you've ever went to the grocery store early in the morning, then you will know exactly what I mean. She makes a 20 minute drive and pulls into the parking lot. Lucy parks near the front entrance and begins to make entries into her checkbook. Matt had eyes on her vehicle the moment that she pulled in. He gets out of his car and starts walking over to Lucy's. According to Lucy's statement to police, once he reached her, he started kind of like walking back and forth around her car. Like trying to come up with a plan or trying to build up his nerve? Probably a little bit of both. At first, she didn't pay him any mind and goes back to balancing her checkbook. A minute or so passes and Matt is knocking on her window. Lucy rolls the window down and he asks her what time it is, to which she looks down at her watch and tells him it's 6.30 in the morning. Matt makes small conversation, telling her that, you know, he just wondered because he was waiting on his sister. And where was his sister? He was never waiting on his sister. But he tells Lucy he's waiting on his sister who's inside shopping. She's been in there for a while, and he was just checking before he goes in to see if she's almost done. Matt walks to the front of Lucy's vehicle just for a moment, just to walk back and tap on her window again. He asks her for the time again, and again, she tells him. But this time, she doesn't get her window back up. Lucy starts to roll her window up when Matt punches her in the face. He opens the driver's side door and pushes his way in. He forces poor Lucy into the passenger seat. He slams the door shut and grabs onto her hair, pulling her face down while he drives off with Lucy held captive. Matt tells her, and I quote, I want you to know that I'm a bad man and I will kill you. You can live through this though. You just have to do exactly as I say. Scared and in complete shock, Lucy simply says, Okay. Oh, I'd say she was in shock. Not just because she's an older woman, but you're now being kidnapped by this big guy who just told you that he would kill you. I, I'd be terrified. Oh, I can't even imagine. Anyway, so he drives her about five minutes away up Aflex into Burnwell until he finds a secluded spot. Not only does he rob Lucy but he also brutally rapes her and sodomizes her. After he's finished, he puts her into the trunk of her own vehicle and for whatever reason, after a bit of time passes, he decides to let her back into the passenger seat. Her feelings are overwhelming, to say the least, but her instinct for survival is still kicking. Matt makes a decision that ultimately worked in Lucy's favor. He gets out of the car momentarily and of course takes the keys with him thinking, He still has her in this grip. Well, I'm sure he probably did. I mean, she's an older woman, and I'm guessing a lot smaller than him. Yeah. I'd say he even thought if she did try to run, that he could chase her down. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. In his mind, she can't run away. He's got the key. I mean, where's she going to go? Or so he thought. And knowingly to him, Lucy kept her spare key in the glove box. She waits for her moment and then takes it. As quickly as she can, she grabs the keys jumps in the driver's seat, pushes pedal to the metal, and takes off. She flees for safety and calls 911, and at this point, he's now on police's radar and running for cover. Where does he run to? Honestly, I'm not quite sure. It's not in any of the court records that I read on Pacer or any articles that I could find. What I do know is that he wasn't anywhere near being finished with his sadistic thoughts. At around 7 that evening, he makes his way into Williamson, West Virginia. Hold on a second. So he abducted Lucy at 6.30 Mm -hmm. uh, in the morning. And it's now after 7, I'm assuming. So, And he hides out all day? Mm Mm-hmm. What about the vehicle he drove to Walmart in? I have no idea. Like, I don't even really know how he got to Williamson. Like, did he walk back to Walmart and get the car? Did he have another car that he took? I, I read an article somewhere that claimed that he lived in Aflix at the time. So... I assume it's possible he had two vehicles. I'm I'm just not sure. Yeah, and you would think that he would know that once Lucy made it out, she would have gone straight to the police. So would he have really risked getting seen by the police by walking back to Walmart? Yeah, I don't know. I would say maybe not just because of what happens that evening. Like I said before, he goes into Williamson around 7 that evening and goes to a friend's house. He knocks on the door and is let in by this said friend who is a woman. She lives there with her five-year-old daughter and the father of her daughter. I'm putting it that way because it it wasn't clearly stated if they were married, dating, or whatnot. In court records, it is stated that he did tell them he was running from police, but I'm 
pretty sure he didn't tell them the truth as to why. I wouldn't think he would. I mean, what's he going to say? Uh, you know, I'm running from the police because I've kidnapped and raped a woman, and now they're out looking for me? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm sure they probably did ask what was happening, and he probably downplayed it. Matt stays for a little bit and keeps his eye on the five-year-old little girl. He talks to her and plays with her as one would any child, really, until he takes his shot. When her parents are out of sight, he entices the little girl to leave with him. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. It's unclear in the records where he took her, but what is clear is that he drove her around the area to another secluded spot where he again does one of the worst things someone can do. He rapes the five-year-old little girl as well. All the while, police are running around trying to find this lower-than-low-life man. Did the parents know she left with him? Oh, no. Once they realize he's gone and so is their daughter, they immediately call authorities. You know, he's been looked for all day. But one thing was kind of making it hard for police. They didn't know for sure what he was driving or what he was in. However... The little girl's parents knew exactly what vehicle he had, so they were able to give authorities the lead they needed. Now he's not just being looked for. When they found out that he's kidnapped a baby, he's being hunted, and for good reason. Most of the area were let known he was wanted for kidnapping and rape, therefore it didn't take too long for people to start calling in tips of seeing his vehicle, pretty much like a play-by-play of where he's at. Before long, he gets spotted by an officer, and from there starts this high-speed chase of what they're looking at as life or death for this child. And that's usually the way we think of it, especially knowing, knowing what he's already done to this you know, elderly woman. We're going to automatically think the worst. Mm-hmm. If he threatened to kill her, then what's going to stop him from doing the same to the kid? Yep. You had officers from all over the area looking for this man. Cruisers running down every street, on the four lane, just praying to get a hold of him. And when that one officer spots him, the rest follows. They chase him into Kentucky and end up apprehending him in the curve of South Williamson where the old Papa John's building used to be. They pull him from the vehicle and have him down on the ground in almost like a blink of an eye. One of the other officers checks the vehicle and ends up finding that five-year-old little girl in the back seat scared, confused, and disheveled. Through everything, though, she was able to tell police that he took her without her parents knowing. I'm surprised she could even, well, he was even willing to talk to the police. I mean, after something traumatic like that, mm-hmm. especially what she's been through. Yeah. Yeah, it's not uncommon for children just to shut down, to not say anything to anyone, you know, especially adults. Yeah. I mean, we see it all the time in these types of situations. And she just, uh, she had to be a strong little girl, you know, to be able to do that. Oh, yeah. Strong for sure. Especially after everything she was just put through, not just physically, but mentally. Medics are called and the baby is sent to Pipeville Medical Center to be examined. It's there that the doctor confirms exactly what Matt has done through DNA swabs, rape kits, etc. Doctors are 100% without a doubt sure that she was not just raped, but sodomized too. And things like this just piss me off to no extreme. You know what I mean? I, I know. I mean, it's just for a child to do something like this to a child is, is yes. I, unimaginable. Yes. Like, I feel like, you know, raping, do not, get me, do not get me wrong. Raping someone is bad. Okay. And stuff like that pisses me off too. But there's just something about, you know, when you, when you take a child's innocence, you know, that to me, that just... Ooh, God, that just fuels me to, ooh. That just, mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, of course he's arrested in Pike County and set on a $1 million cash bond. So how much would he have to pay to get out on bond? Oh, he's not getting out. Oh, well. He wouldn't have got out on that. Well, I thought whatever your bond was, you paid like 10% of that. No, I'm thinking his was a, a full cash bond. Yeah. Uh, when you have cash bond, that means exactly what they tell you. Uh, for example, he'd have to pay $1 million in cash. Uh, unless he was a millionaire, that's not happening. Oh, I, I'd okay. say even if he was a millionaire, they would set the bond higher. Uh, and, and there's not any bails, bail bondsman that's you know going to come up with that kind of cash. And especially for what he's charged with. I don't, I don't see anyone trying to help him out with that. Oh, well, hmm. the more you know. <laughs> 
As it turns out, Matt doesn't get out. He stays behind bars while the case, or should I say cases, against him piles high. May I remind everyone that this happened on December 14th, right around Christmas, and with the holidays right around the corner, you expect to see what you always do in papers and on the news. Photos with Santa, places to look at Christmas lights, schools, churches, or organizations that are having Christmas plays, but instead, starting the morning of December 15th, you had every major news outlet in the area talking about Matthew Casey and his day of absolute hell. It wasn't just in the newspapers or on TV, though. People all over the area were talking about it. You just didn't hear about things like this happening around here. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the news of it was just spreading like wildfire. Uh, Just constant theories of how he chose this woman and and this girl. Yet it wasn't just people trying to make those theories. Behind the scenes, authorities were trying to find out how all of this had come about too. Were the victims related or, you know, whatnot. But after questioning parties, it came about that there was no relation. There was no plan specifically towards the both of them. He had just gone out and chose who crossed his path. And people started keeping a closer eye on their kids and was beginning to try to be more aware of who they let into their children's lives because of this. But for every person that was frightened, there were others that were ticked the hell off. Others that wanted officers to let him free so they could have a massive witch hunt to burn him at the stake. And my God, what a glorious day that that would have been. And as great as that may have been, that's something that really just can't happen. I'm sure the officers really wish they could, or, you know. Uh, and you mentioned earlier that the evidence was just piling up on him. What not did it have? A lot. They had taken out the automobile seat covers and back seat of the vehicle he was in. And the knife he had on him during his entire rampage. And an air ratchet, which I'm not even sure really what that is. An air ratchet's just a powered wrench. Uh, It's run by an air compressor. Oh, okay. It's the same thing as a regular ratchet, except it works with an air compressor. Oh, okay. Is it heavy? Not really. Then I wonder why he had it with him. He either stole it or he might have just been in the vehicle. Good point. I was just wondering, like, if he had it because he planned to use it as a, like, a weapon or whatever. It could have been used as a weapon. Almost anything can be used as a weapon. (laughs) Another good point. (laughs) Well, moving on. Inside the vehicle, they also recovered a pop as far as items that possibly contained DNA. All clothing, including underwear from him and the victims, were obtained. The rape kits that were administered on Lucy and the young girl, which involved vaginal and anal swabs. Authorities also took samples of Matt's DNA through hair, penile swabs, external penile swabs, and blood. Was there semen or any of Matt's DNA found on Lucy or the five-year-old? There was, and after the results of those DNA tests came back positive, it had Matt and his attorney grasping for men to throw at the wall. Originally, this trial was going to be set before a jury. I looked through what felt like a million court documents on this case, and there was one thing I picked up on. For every speck of evidence, that includes physical DNA, interviews, and witnesses, there was another motion to continue sent out from Matt's defense. Which is to be figured for the defense. Especially in something like this, it's kind of a high profile just for everything that's right. been, he's been... Well, I mean, it was. It was high <clears throat> profile. Everybody was talking about this when it happened. Yeah, and in something like this where every week you're going to be collecting more and more evidence to put, you know, to keep him behind bars. Yeah. You're also going to have a defense attorney who's going to request more time to look at everything because any evidence that the state gets, they're going to have more time to evaluate that evidence. Which is why, you know, in a court of law, it's important that whatever evidence is collected, whether it's DNA or witness testimonies, that the defense also gets to look at it before trial. And, you know, hence everyone has a right to a fair trial. Well, with every piece of new evidence, Matt's defense is trying to find something to reroute the blame, at least when it comes to the little girl. There was one thing, though, that I don't even know what the point or where they were trying to go. His defense attorney ends up requesting that they obtain state abuse and neglect records from West Virginia and Kentucky. 
stating that the parents have abused, abandoned, or neglected the child before. Now, I want to make it very, very clear here that I'm not saying the parents have done anything to that little girl. What I am, what I'm trying to say, though, is even if, even, even if that was true, what does that have to do with what he did? Like, that's just going to make what you did okay? Even at that, just because somebody might have called CPS doesn't necessarily mean they've done anything wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know where, where they were going with this. Right? Like, two wrongs do not ever make a right, people. And the fact that he was being backed into a corner where there was no way out without coming clean and telling the truth was just further becoming relevant. After almost two years of motions to continue, Matthew finally agreed to wash his hands with all the bull and pleaded guilty. In September of 2008, Matthew Cook Casey pleads guilty to kidnapping, rape, and sodomy of the five-year-old little girl. Now, prior to all of this, he had already been convicted in Kentucky of kidnapping, robbing, rape, and sodomy of Lucy in November 2007. So he'd already been convicted in the state of Kentucky for Lucy. Mm -hmm. And the the five-year-old girl was a federal charge, right? Because he kidnapped her and took her across state lines. Yeah. Well, what happened with all that? Listen, for whatever reason, when I was on Pacer looking his stuff up, it was only showing me the case against the little girl. I do know through an article online, though, that there was video surveillance from Walmart where she had parked near the entrance that showed him pushing his way into Lucy's car and taking off. So I'm going to assume that he pleaded guilty, considering that was in black and white. Yeah, that's pretty hard to de- you know defend against. Yeah. Anyway, so he was already convicted of that and was sentenced to life in prison. When it came to his convictions of the little girl, he received three life sentences on each charge and they were to be served consecutively with his life sentence in Kentucky. Today, Matthew Cook Casey can be found behind bars at the Kentucky State Penitentiary where he will be spending the remaining of his days. Exactly where he belongs. Definitely. Today... That little girl is now a beautiful young woman. Throughout the years, she's had therapy and lives a normal life. After everything Lucy was forced through that day, she's never lost her faith in God and continues to praise his name still to this day. Matt did more than just commit heinous acts that day. He stole a child's innocence, which is just something that you can't get back. He tested a woman's faith that could have easily turned her life dark and hopeless. In the end, though, both Lucy and that little girl proved their strength, and their light shone brighter than they ever have before, and that is something that he can never take. Again, I'm your host, Gabrielle. And I'm Alan. We'll talk next week. You can check out our website, theeerietouch.com, for our reference photos and source materials for each episode. You can listen to this podcast on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or whatever platform you listen to your podcast on. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for new leads and updates. And we would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star review on whatever you listen to your podcast. It could really help us out.